Will you bring together several very small passages of the Word of God, beginning in the prophecies of Isaiah, Isaiah's prophecies, chapter 45, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings, to open the doors before him, and the gate shall not be shut. I will go before thee, to make the rugged places plain. I will break in pieces the doors of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I am the Lord which call thee by thy name, even the God of Israel. Prophecies of Jeremiah Jeremiah chapter 25 verse 12 And it shall come to pass when seventy years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation set the Lord for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and I will make it desolate forever. Chapter 29 at verse 10 Thus saith the Lord After seventy years be accomplished for Babylon I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. The book of Ezra. Chapter 1. Verse 2. Verse 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus said Cyrus, king of of Persia, and so on. And finally, in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 2, the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet for the accomplishing of the desolations of Jerusalem, even seventy years. I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fastings and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made confession. These passages, the word of God, as you realize, compass a history. They embody a history. But a history which declares one great Bible truth. 
and that is the truth of the sovereignty of God in relation to his house. The sovereignty of God as related to the house of God. Now to stand back from that for a moment, there is no mistaking one feature of history as it is recorded in the Bible. From beginning to end, that one feature is the feature of a great conflict. We hardly get into the Bible before we find ourselves in the realm of controversy, dispute, challenge, and conflict. So early, the Lord himself pronounced that there would be conflict. And right on through almost to the end. That is the characteristic of Bible history. But when we look to see what the occasion of the conflict is, we t find two major factors. A primary and a secondary. The primary factor is the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord. I do not mean any particular designation of God, but the honor, the supremacy, the uniqueness of the name of the Lord, its supremacy in this universe. It is primarily over that that all the controversy and all the conflict that is in the Bible rages. For its dethroning, for its dishonoring, on the one side, for its maintenance, upholding, purity and glory on the other side. The name of the Lord. But the secondary factor in the conflict is a vessel or a people for that name. Immediately, God moves to secure for himself that where he may put his name. And it is a people, what we may in the larger term call a vessel. Immediately God moves in relation to a vessel for his name. You find you're in the atmosphere again of conflict of challenge, of disputing. The battle begins. The name of the Lord lies behind everything. That is the ultimate. But the vessel for the name lies in the forefront of everything. These two are related. What touches that vessel that is in the forefront affects the name which is behind, involves the name. Let us come to the designation of that vessel, the house of God, the house for his name, wherever and whenever 
we touch the house of God in the Bible, it is not long before everything springs into life. It springs into life. On the one side, we touch something that is vital to God, about which he is greatly concerned, over which he is very jealous. God, the living God, is associated with this. Touch it is to touch the living God. To meet it is to meet the living God. In the Bible, the house is always alive on the one side. That is, when you touch the house of God, you're not just touching a dead thing. You're touching something that is alive. It is vital to God. On the other hand, whenever you come into touch with the house of God in the Bible, you come into touch with forces which are inimical, antagonistic to what it represents and means to God. In other words, the house of God is the center of a whole age-long conflict. I'm not staying to gather up the data in that connection. Anyone who knows the Bible knows quite well how true that is. Here is something that has got to be, if possible, countered, overthrown, destroyed, and nullified. But for our purpose just now, it is so very important, dear friends, that we recognize how closely related are the sovereignty of God and the house of God. The sovereignty of God and the house of God. That carries so much with it. That sovereignty will be on our side. If we are on the side, to put it this way, of the house of God. That sovereignty is shown in the word of God to be against all who in any way are against the house of God. Perhaps some of the most terrible words in the New Testament are those used by the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians when he said of them as a company. Another connection, he spoke of them as individuals, but in this particular passage he spoke of them as a company when he said, Ye are a temple of God a company and then he went on if any man destroy the temple of God him shall God destroy God's jealous sovereignty over his house but if it is true that the sovereignty of God is bound up with his house it is equally true that the house of God is the object always of satanic antagonism to spoil it if possible. Now, we have to reduce this very large matter to a few quite definite practical points. Let us say at once, there are no alternatives to the house of God. With God, there are no alternatives to the church. 
because of all the controversies, the conflicts, the confusion in relation to the church. Many have sought to turn away from that to some alternatives or substitutes. We know of many who because of the so unhappy situations and conditions in Christendom which center in this word church have turned from all that kind of thing as they call it church teaching and church truth and they have turned to evangelism and they have said, well, let the church get on with itself. We will give ourselves to the salvation of souls. As an alternative, you see. I'm not saying that in all evangelism that is the motive, that is the why. But it is true that something perhaps of almost disgust with what we will call churchianity, sectarianism, all the quarrels and the divisions that has been thrust aside and we'll get on with the business of soul saving. An alternative. Others have decided that the course is world evangelization. Let us take the gospel to the nations. Leave all this about the church and get on with the great business of world evangelization. Again, all world evangelization is not prompted by that thought or feeling, but we know that it is there. There are others who have said, well, let the church get on with itself while we attend to the needs of mankind, of humanity in this world, the sufferings and the misery and the poverty and the whatnot. And they have committed themselves to what is called the social gospel of improving human life for men and women. Now I am not saying for one moment that these things are not right. In themselves they are. Quite right in themselves. But if they are an alternative to the church, see what will happen. The vast amount of energy and expenditure and evangelism, and how much as the result permanent abiding result without a great margin of disappointment in comparison with what we have in the New Testament. The evangelism of the New Testament what a tremendous thing that was. How accountable it was and effective. But it was always related to the church. It was church evangelism. Not evangelism as something in itself. Evangelization of the world, well it's in the New Testament. See the gospel going to the nations. The great compass and range in a brief period of 30 years. Their word, it says, went into all the earth because it was on church ground. Divide between, separate these things and let there be that which is an alternative for any reason at all. And what happens? Well, what a costly thing is world evangelization 
in means and people and what not to uh, a result of fruitfulness which cannot compare with those 30 years of the New Testament those first 30 years and then remember the Lord comes back sooner or later the whole thing is shaken to find out what is really solid and real and true and the whole matter of the house of God springs into life again and the very survival survival depends upon what the house of God represents that is fellowship that is intercession that is relatedness now God always moves and here I speak with the Bible in mind God always moves in relation to his main object it may be a long term thing it may be true that the mills of God grind very slowly but it is true they grind exceeding small God never departs from his original and primary premise and that is a house for his name now you see in these scriptures we have read how true that is we have read the words of Isaiah chapter 45 thus saith the Lord to Cyrus and then we have gathered around that these other words and come back at last to Ezra and to Daniel do you know dear friends that Isaiah prophesied those words or uttered those words of prophecy about Cyrus nearly 200 years before Cyrus made that decree or came onto the scene at all nearly 200 years elapsed between Isaiah saying thus saith the Lord to Cyrus Cyrus was an unknown person when Isaiah uttered those words All through that time, you've got the completion of the ministry of Isaiah, all his life, the rest of his life, overlapping into Jeremiah, and you have all the life and work of Jeremiah all through those years. And then you've got to add in the 70 years of captivity as in fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy all those years but at last God moves sovereignly in relation to his house yes he's waited long but here it is maybe a long way ahead not of his choosing but by reason of his people failure nevertheless so far ahead God has still got his object and he's not going to abandon it. He's coming back to it. Let years pass. Let there be infinite suffering in the meantime. At length, he's coming back to it. He's going to have it. That's New Testament truth as well as Old Testament truth. All this. It's a remarkable thing, isn't it? That the sovereignty of God mentions a man's name before that man was born sovereignty of God chooses him as the vessel before anybody knows anything about him sovereignty of God details what he will do I have girded thee although thou hast not known me says the word what the man will do and what will happen long long years before the man is in view at all sovereignty of God moving right ahead over all that intervenes because that sovereignty is bound up with his house bound up with his house and he's not going to let that thing go because his name is 
inextricably and inseparably bound up with a vessel for the name. He must have it. But in the meantime, in the meantime, all the suffering, the suffering of the captivity, of the exile, but what was the deepest cause of the suffering? And putting our finger upon this, we touch this whole matter at a very vital point. What was the deepest cause of all the suffering and all the delay? It was the lack of a heart relationship with the house for his name. Oh, the house was there. The house was there. It was called the house of God. That is, the building was there, and a name was on it, name Jehovah. The ritual was carried on every day, the whole framework and formality proceeded. But you know from the prophets that this people's heart is far from me, said the Lord. There was not a heart relationship with the house. Thing was but an object. Something that was kept going. But people had no correspondence and heart with the jealousy of God. For its purity because of his name for its livingness because he was the living God so cold so formal so hollow so unreal the cry of the prophets was always about this heart matter how the Lord tried to bring that home to his people through such men as Hosea and Ezekiel, whom he brought into deep and terrible suffering and sorrow in public, so that everybody could see this man, this young prophet whose wife has died, this other young prophet whose wife has been unfaithful and gone after other lovers. And it's all brought out that everybody could see the tragedy in their lives and say, oh, isn't this terrible? Isn't this terrible? If they had any sensibility, any feeling at all, it would touch their hearts, but it didn't. And when they asked what the meaning was, the prophet said, this is just but an, uh, an expression, a representation of you and the Lord unfaithfulness, loss, and you're not touched. You're not touched. This prophet, when his wife dies, has at once to go out before the people with his face anointed, no sign whatever of mourning or of grief or of tragedy, and the people say, this is a scandal. It's a man who's lost his wife. He's showing no sign of sorrow. It's a scandal. And at once the prophet has his message. Yes, but you have lost more than I have. You've lost far more than I have and you don't care. You see, it's all on this matter of a heart relationship with what is of God. While it was like that, they were still keeping up the temporal service. Outwardly the house was there, but there was no heart there. That's what brought all the suffering so the Lord had to bring them back to the place where they cried, How can we sing the songs of Zion in a strange land? See, ah, the heart's waking up now, longing for what has been lost, which can no longer be had. Sense of the need of that, the need of it. And they can't get it. A consciousness 
It is not just an empty form, framework, or even teaching, but it's something vital and consequential to their very life, this house of God. That's how it must be, dear friend. We must have such a relationship to the house of God that it is vital to our existence, essential to our life, and to lose that is to lose what we most need of all things. In this land, the house of God. But then, in order for it to be like that, something's got to happen somewhere. And that is why I read the words from Daniel. Daniel, away there in the midst of it, all in Babylon, says, I learn from the books, the times, spoken by Jeremiah, the prophet, the time, 70 years. And I prayed with fasting, sackcloth and ashes, supplication, and I didn't read his prayer. It's a heart-rending prayer, that prayer of Daniel in Babylon. And do you say that that had nothing to do with, no relationship with, the going back of the remnant to rebuild the house. I say it did. I say that was God's pivot of delivery and recovery. The man in Babylon who prayed like that. And until somewhere, somehow, there is that which will get to God in dire anguish about the situation, in travailing prayer, over his house. The thing will go on and go on. He must have that. It has always been God's way. We can go through the Bible and see how true that is. That even in the great sovereign movements of God, his sovereignty has not been separate from someone who entered into his travail. Like that factor of travailing prayer must be present in reality. We must close. But note, when we are in line with God's object and purpose like that, and it has become really a heart matter of suffering to us, and God has a people, has a people who are so committed to the thing which is so close to his heart. See what wonderful thing God, things God does. The facilitation of his house. The means provided. We've got to read Ezra, haven't we, again? And Nehemiah. Read how the Lord stirred up the spirit of this pagan king who knew him not. And how by his decree every Every means was provided. God is sovereign over all resources, over all needs, and their supplies. God is sovereign, get into line with the thing that is nearest to his heart. And you get into line with the operation of that sovereignty on the one side to provide, to meet all demands. On the other side, to meet the enemy. But it's not for me to close there without saying that even when the remnant got back and started on the building of the house, there were still enemies, and there always will be. Always will be. Those Samaritans gave that remnant a terrible time, even to the point of suspending operations for some years. The people's fault. But there are always enemies about where the house of God is in view. Make no mistake about it. Always will be those Samaritans that gave that remnant a terrible time, even to the point of suspending operations for some years. The people's fault, but there are always enemies about where the house of God is in view. Make no mistake about it, but, and we must finish on the note where we began, the sovereignty of God is related to that.